I think it's great that Andrea talked. Andrea talked about inclusion because I thought I would talk about networks. Uh, I don't really know what inclusion means, but I do have a double hat where you know I, I used to be a computer science student who then became a cultural theorist and is now going back to kind of. Uh, rediscovering the fact that the digital is made out of code um, and that there is hardware and there's, there's assembly and beyond cultural practice and social dynamics is this incredible control mechanism which emerges with technology itself. So I, uh, when I first got the invitation I was kind of confused because I thought that my colleagues at Center for Internet and Society who do much closer work with policy advocacy uh, would be perhaps better fits into it and then Anita convinced me that no, I would be included in the conversations. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'll try and stick to time but let me begin with a really short story as a cliffhanger, right? We'll, we'll go back to it and it's a slightly tragic story. Um, that in 2013, a young teenager in Canada, her name was Amanda Todd, created something called a note card video. I don't know if you're familiar with it but a j note card video is now a genre that's become the default aesthetic of internet confessionals, testimonials, and fight backs on the social web, especially for young people, right? So it's, uh, in, in, in the case of Amanda, for example, she hid her face uh, behind a note cards that produced a narrative of abuse, of hatred, of slut shaming, and of continued peer bullying. Uh, at the end, she reveals herself and she says, I am Amanda Todd, but she never shows you her face. Uh, and there is a reason for it, because at the end of the note card video, in three days, she's going to kill herself. Right? So you're not really ever going to see Amanda Todd afterwards once she's hidden herself behind the note card videos. Uh, and I'm going to kind of ask you to hang on to this story as I take you through my own preoccupations of what does the network actually mean? Uh, what are the points of inclusion that we're talking about? And I'll return to this to specifically talk about intersections of technology, gender and body at the end of it. Um, so to quickly go back to the idea of a network, uh, it's really fascinating how prone we are to forgetting that in the relative history of language, concepts, and frameworks, the network is such a young thing. Uh, in terms that if you, if you go and ask somebody right now, there are historians who are writing about networks of colonization. There are science, technology, and society studies discourses. We are talking about networks of knowledge transfers. Network seems to be the default explanatory framework which takes care of both our histories as well as our imagined futures. That if there is one vocabulary which kind of brings all of it together, it is the network. And at the same time, the network, even for those who build it, is an incredibly complicated and inscrutable thing. Because you can't really name a network. You can't particularly define it. You can make snapshots out of it. You can do visual, beautiful visualizations out of it. Uh, you can even show a thing and say this is networks. Um, it's almost like pornography, right? So that you can't define it, but when you see it, you know it, that this is a network. And this ineffability of the network is what I'm really curious about. Because increasingly, more and more people seem to take the for granted that the network is a way by which we can actually represent our reality, analyze our reality, and then change our reality, right? So if we take network societies really seriously, which is what this provocation is, then we will have to actually look at what are our presumptions that we build into the making of a network, and how do we start deconstructing them to look at much larger questions of power and control which are embedded in it. Um, so I have three provocations which I'm borrowing from some of my work but also from some of the other works which I'm reading right now. The first provocation is to suggest to you um, that the network is an opaque metaphor, right? The network as we understand it right now seems to suggest that there is this thing, that the network is almost a tool that is useful to explain that part of reality which is so messy that it cannot be comprehended by human agency. Right? Um, so what the network appears is, is this lens by which different complicated relationalities, uh, intricate transactions, human actions and agency can be mapped together and so that some sort of a sense can be made out of it. Wendy Chun in her fantastic book called Freedom and Control had suggested that the digital increasingly seems to produce this thing called opaque metaphors where the network seeks to explain something that is unfamiliar to us by the familiar lens of a network, but at the end of the story, what the network explains is itself. And if I say this, it should, it should just come to us as common sense, because the minute we start talking about the problems with a network, and if you look at network theory, for example, 
Now, there are only two pre-wired responses available to us. The first is that the network cannot, has not included enough, but that's not a problem of the network. It only means that we don't have enough data tools, data mining and harvesting tools, to include things into the network. Right? It's always presumed that the network is this all-encompassing, inclusive thing, and that if things are being left out of it, it's only because we just need better tools of quantification and harvesting deeper so that these things can be included in the network. And the second response that comes to network theory or this networkization of the world is that um, the network is now creating so much information that we now need better tools to understand the information that's being produced by the network, right? Because the network also now is supra-human in terms that Facebook as a network has information which can no longer be read, passed, or understood, or even comprehended by human beings reading it in any form. So there is this way by which all crises of network are not essentially crises outside the network, but of the, cri of the network itself. So if we buy into the network paradigm, then all we do is try and improve the network more and more without questioning its legitimacy in any form. So that's the notion of the network as an opaque metaphor. Um, the second provocation I have is from Duncan Watts, who is more or less the father of modern computational network theory, uh, where Watts had suggested that networks have no exteriority. Yeah? He, in fact, Watts is a physical computing guy who then gets into cultural and social theory and basically gets ostracized from both the disciplines and in fact drives himself to madness by the end of his tenure. Um, because he said that you sociologists and humanists who think that the network actually has an exteriority have got it wrong entirely. He in fact go goes on to say that the problem with us who do not understand network as code or network as, as computation is that we still think of networks through the lenses of representation. We believe that there is an exteriority there and that the reduced abstraction, the visualization of a network that we map and feel happy about seeks to represent that particular exteriority. And what's his argument in this first paper he writes called The Small World Phenomenon is that uh, the network is a product of simulation and not of representation. Which means that all of our politics, which are very closely tied into the idea of representation in terms that there is an exteriority and this is what it seeks to represent, is completely false. He says the network, as we understand it, is only a simulation which is a rendering of rules, protocols, designs, parameters, and mathematical functions which approximate a reality but not necessarily reflect it. He further goes on to suggest in the book that simulation has ties with prediction just as representation has ties with revealing. And so mistaking the visual snapshot of a network as the network of relationships that actually physically exist is a fallacy. That there is no way by which you could make this particular bridge where you say that here is a networked representation and that this is what the exteriority looks like. The third provocation I have is from another person who went mad and got ostracized by multiple disciplines. I seem to have an obsession with mad men right now not just the TV series, um, uh, and which is about a visual map, and this is Philip Agri, uh, who basically said that the network does not exist, right? which is the best provocation somebody can ever give you. He says the network is only a random assimilation of traffic as it moves from one point to another, and creation of edges and nodes which are tenuous, transitory, and prone to decay and degeneration. That, in fact, to presume that the network exists before an action is a complete inversion of logical fallacy. And that what we really need to do is start thinking about what are the kinds of vested interests which go into defining a certain set of transactions and actions as networked phenomenon. Yeah? And I'll kind of end by saying that uh, what the network essentially does is that in order for things to be included within the network, if these three things are taken seriously, the thing has to become writable, in which case you have to become legible or, or, or in a condition where the network can write you in a particular form. The thing has to become legible, and this is no longer about human legibility, not you and me reading each other, but then being legible to the network's own parameters and protocols. The thing then has to become intelligible. 
right? That not just having having been written and having been understood by the network parameter, you now need to be able to produce meanings which are in a surplus in such a way that the network actually understands it. The next stage is being accessible and the last stage is being retrievable. Things which do not follow this particular protocol will always be outside of the network's paradigm. And the only way by which the network actually manages to perform any act of inclusion is by saying that I will now produce data sets which will stand in for this thing which I cannot account for and I can only include that data set into me. Right? And so when you come to Amanda Todd's video in particular, here was somebody who was absolutely included in terms that she lives in a first world country, she goes to a school, she is white, she is straight, and yet she remains excluded from within the network paradigm because that particular network, which is the social web and Facebook and YouTube, were not able to understand that of Amanda Todd, which could not be quantified, which could not be enumerated, which could not be traced and mined for data, because it remained in the realm of the experiential, the agential, and the aspirational. And what do we do now when we say that we want to include more people within the network paradigm is that are we going to then convert people only as things that the network understands or are we actually going to stop and say maybe things don't need to be included in the network because the network is not the default explanatory framework of our times. That the network, and I'll just end here, uh, because the network right now seems to be this incredibly strange thing where it is the object of analysis the lens of analysis and the explanation given as well. So that when you are asked a question now saying what is a network, there are people who look at you with bafflement and then they say a network um, is a network. And that's where it ends. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.